In today's video, I finally finished the process of acquiring pure water from a forest spring. Viewers of this channel will remember that I started the process last summer when I began the Aspirin from Scratch series. The rules are that I need to forage every ingredient for Aspirin from nature, so today I'll be walking through the process of purifying water. My goal is to do a single stage distillation to get ISO 3696 grade 3 water, which will be good enough for basic analytical work. For this project, I'm using the sulfur spring I found last time. As we saw in a previous video, it will also contain the salt I'll need for future steps. It's funny that water and salt are bound up like this. Ancient people probably recognized that they often found one with the other, and over time, this vital duo became conjoined together into the image of a god. For example, the Egyptian gods Osiris and Hapi were associated with the Nile River and its cyclical flooding and retreating which grew crops and left behind mineral deposits. In Christianity, Jesus Christ is portrayed as a kind of spiritual water and his followers as a salt to bring out the best in humankind. Heading back to the sulfur spring, I grabbed as much water as I could with my cousin and walked a two kilometer path back to the car. You do this once and you'll know how lucky you are if you have a faucet in your home. In the months prior, I had tried to collect water through the rain, but those guides that instruct you to lay a sheet of plastic over a container probably weren't thinking of a lakeside climate where rain often comes with heavy winds. Anyways, let's see what we have. With two people, we collected about 60 liters in two hours, including travel time, or 15 liters per hour if I just worked by myself. The water is crystal clear and appears blue when placed in a white bucket. I set up a single stage distillation using a 1 liter round bottom flask, a PID controlled heating mantle, and a 10 millimeter inner diameter 300 millimeter long Wesley condenser with appropriate adapters. The Wesley condenser is fed countercurrent via siphon from a room temperature reservoir on top of the table to a collection bucket below. I use countercurrent flow so that whatever makes it over encounters increasingly colder conditions, and that essentially guarantees it will be a liquid by the time it makes it to the collecting vessel. Using a leaky plug, I adjust the flow rate to about half a liter of cooling water per minute. When the bottom bucket is full, I manually do the recycle, about once every 20 minutes. On the boiler side, I charge the round bottom flask a bit past halfway with spring water by first running it through a coffee filter in a funnel to catch any outdoor debris. The temperature probe is fitted to the flask using a thermometer adapter I modified with a piece of rubber band to keep everything airtight. One thing I really like about using three necked flasks like this is that you have two ports for connections and still have one for direct access to the contents. I usually keep the center neck a larger diameter just to make adding and removing stuff easier. The controller set point is set to 105 degrees Celsius. Using the temperature probe, the heating mantle will use a PID control algorithm to raise the heat until the temperature probe reaches the temperature we entered. Since water will never get hotter than 100 degrees at atmospheric pressure, setting it to 105 essentially tells the controller to keep adding heat no matter what, which means we're always producing steam. That's what we want. This constant production of steam manifests itself as a rolling boil, so that's what we need to look for. You can see steam not really getting to the condenser and dripping on the side of this adapter, so I add a piece of tin foil to insulate it all. At the end of the condenser we have a drip tube leading into a beaker. The end is open to the room air because heating a closed system is generally explosively bad. After about 40 minutes of heating, I collect about 400 milliliters and I empty out the distillate side in a clean bucket. The boiling flask, or bottom side, contains the salt, and I save it in a separate bucket. I wait for the boiling flask to cool down so I don't thermally shatter it, and then I refill it with room temperature spring water for another cycle. I repeat the cycle a few more times, but then a whole bunch of time passes while I was working on the sulfur and apple vinegar videos in this series. Coming back two months later, you can start to see the water becoming a bit dirty and green with algae, but it's still generally clear and nothing a bit of coffee filter paper can't handle. I do this a few more cycles again, but then another whole bunch of time passes while I went through a job change. 
By this point, it's September, and I'll let Avian from a few months ago explain. As you can see, the spring water's still in these three big buckets here, and if you pull off the lid, you'll see it's gotten really gross since then. Now, as gross as this is, it does remind me of a video from the creator of Life in Jars, where he leaves a bucket of water out just like this, and all these plants and animals start to spontaneously grow in it. It's like, life finds a way, man. But since I need the water right now, uh, I really can't do anything with this. Like, all of the plants and animals that spontaneously grow, it's cool and all, but it also gets caught in the filter and everything. It's just, it's way too contaminated. I'm just gonna continue with the water I already have inside. So now the water is way too dirty to do this. At this point, I would need to do multiple distillations to clean the rest. So far, I had collected about 5 liters of distillate, which we'll have to do. Besides, it had been a few months, and I'm hoping to finish this whole aspirin project before I die. I just had one flask of spring water, which I had stopped halfway through months prior that I need to complete. In the meantime though, I discovered why the ISO standard requires regular checks on the reservoirs where the stuff is kept, because any fresh water that's kept still, inside or outside, will start to mold. You can see some black specks here, and that's mold growing on the side of the bucket. The salt water from the bottoms was fine though. I filtered all the distillate into another bucket using the coffee filter funnel and washed the original container with soap and water. Transforming the bottom salt water into a white bucket, you can see that while the distillate has the characteristic blue color of clean water, the bottom side is yellow. Figuring out what salts are present to cause the color change will be a task for a future video. The final yield of single distilled water and brine was 68 plus minus 7% and 32 plus minus 3% respectively. Note that in chemical engineering, these measurements are often captured by a single number called a reflux ratio, which characterizes the performance of your distillation column. This is calculated by dividing the bottom's mass by the distillate mass. In this case, I operated the distillation process with a reflux ratio of 47 plus minus 5%. But before I end all this off, of course, I need to try drinking it. Okay, so the water's cooled down now. Let's give it a taste test. Again, colorless, just like this one smells like nothing. You know, oddly, it has a kind of like a burnt flavor to it. Not sure what that's from. Like if you've had um, bottled water that's been distilled, um, it has a strange texture and flavor, right? Um, well, this is like that, but add in a little bit of burnt. So that's it. After 12 months, I've acquired clean water and brine and can add them to my process graph. The distilled water is now considered unlocked and I can use purchased sources for future steps in this series. Thank God. A big thanks goes out to my supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to support future steps in the Aspen from Scratch project, go to patreon.com slash avianyoon.
Thank you.